So, uh, I'm going to make a start now. Um, first of all, thanks to to Barry and everyone uh, at Incubate for superbly well organised um, uh, festival, and thanks to everyone for coming to listen today. Um, I hope some of you or most of you were at Simon Reynolds' talk, which just happened, because uh, in response to that talk, uh, basically scrapped what, what, I was, what I was planning to do, and um, kind of at least initially um, be developing a sort of series of responses to what to what Simon said. Um, you know, partly because of that makes that will make the talk more specific to this sort of DIY theme, which I think. Is, is a crucial theme at the moment. And, and the issues that Simon raised in his talk um, about the politics of DIY and the recuperation um, of DIY are, are, I think, crucial at every level at the moment, crucial at every level, uh, and, and especially in terms of politics and culture and the relationship between the two. And, relation, uh, uh, you know, and I, I think a lot of the struggles we're engaged in at the moment are you know, over precisely the relationship between um, politics and culture. Um, I mean, as, as I think was clear from Simon's talk, uh, the, the concept of DIY uh, is one around which, uh, well, an attitude of dialectical ambivalence, I think, is, is, is really required in terms of this concept. And especially from me, uh, because... You know, I, the only, well, the, not say the only reason, but the prime reason that I'm here talking to you today is not because uh, I've had a book out, not because uh, I lecture in universities, not because I write in um, magazines and newspapers. Um, the reason I was able to do all those things at all was because of having a blog in the first place. Um, and, you know, being able to develop a form of writing. Uh, which certainly would not have, would not in the first instance have been come out as a book. Uh, there's no way any academic press would have published it. Um, and uh, certainly wouldn't be acceptable uh, in, in, in British journalism at the moment, which is, you know, the British media culture is, ex you know, reached a point of a truly, you know, excruciating middle brow kind of mediocrity. Um, But hang on a minute. Okay, so it, it, to, 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 to some extent, then, or to a large extent, I would say, I owe my uh, position as a cultural figure to the DIY culture, DIY digital culture. But I couldn't just do it myself, as it were. The, the reason I was able to uh, develop the kind of writing that I did um, wasn't from some in, uh, internal resources that I happened to have bestowed upon me. It was because of a cultural inheritance, you know, which, which uh, you know, I was old enough to have benefited from. And that cultural inheritance consists of, um, you know, uh, things like um, public service television of the 1970s and 1980s in Britain. Um, more, more unlikely, uh, in retrospect, source of uh, this cultural inheritance. Uh, it wasn't unlikely at the time, but it now seems unlikely, was the NME, New, New Musical Express. New Musical Express in the 70s and 80s, I mean, was, uh, you know, a source of major kind of intellectual ferment. It was in the, it was the NME where I first saw the names um, Baudrillard um, and Derrida. Um, it wasn't through the formal education system at all. I mean, you know, I hated school and I just didn't do particularly well at school. Um, what drew me into, into intellectual currents was um, reading, of, you know, the, the referred glamour, I think, of the, the theory acquired from being in, in the NME and the, and the contiguity of popular culture and high theory at, at, at this particular moment. Um, and, you know, it's really, I see myself actually as a continuation of this culture uh, in uh, conditions that are massively inhospitable towards, towards that culture actually now. Um, and really, that's what, in a, in a sense, that's what my book, Capitalist Realism, was about. It was about, and really, a lot of my work is about. I mean, what I plan to do today, and what I still may do a little bit of, um, is read you some hot off the press uh, uh, bits from my new book, Ghosts of My Life. And, and uh, really, Ghosts of My Life and Capitalist Realism 
are two sides of, of the same project, I think, which is a project of revealing the inherent negativity of the moment in which we live. And as I was just saying to people uh, before we talked, um, Simon was worried after his talk that it was too d d depressing. Uh, you know, I, I, I said to him, the talk, the talk isn't depressing, the reality is depressing. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, and this is, and, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, I've st sort of struggled with to, to, to realize, actually, um, and faced a lot of hostility with, uh, uh, it, it's certainly in the, in a lot of the, a lot of the very uh, um, intense debates on blogs that went on were really about this question: um, Can one make negative judgments about the present moment, or, or is, or, or is any kind of critical judgment being exercised about culture somehow inherently oppressive? Um, I would say certainly one can make negative judgments about the present moment. And the, to f pursue this dialectical loop to its, you know, to to to, uh, to its full extent, the reason why culture is so bad is there's not enough negativity. The the, the motor of and the motor of culture is negativity and dissatisfaction. Um, you know, like the uh, and if we look back in the, the 1977 or the, the, the punk period, the punk period was full of people who thought they lived in a worst shittest time ever. Now, this is stranger temporal chauvinism. One finds with people today often, where they 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 want to say no no things are really good why, <laughs> you know um, what I think part of that is is defensiveness uh, about the, the full extent of how bad things are you know can't we can't really face it actually, and and, and speaking personally uh, that, that the only reason I was able to cope with the monstrous kind of uh, <laughs> um, a kind of monstrous imposition of of neoliberal culture. Um, was treating as a kind of blip. Um, you know, that I, I, I thought that the culture, the, the, the cultural, in, in, and I don't mean a, the specific content or objects, I mean the cultural infrastructure. The cultural infrastructure that I grew, grew up with and therefore had taken for granted, one thought that would persist and continue forever. And that the kind of, um, you know, what Dennis Potter, the great sort of, uh, TV writer in Britain called it the occupying powers of neoliberalism, and they'd taken over, um, you know, public service television in Britain. You know, we all convinced ourselves this was just a temporary thing, and things would get better. In fact, you know, things got a hell of a lot worse. Um, and you know, you've probably heard that analogy of a, a frog that gradually uh, is boiled to death by the fact that the temperature goes up only only slightly, uh, and uh, until the point where it's dead. Uh, and, and I think this is the this is the situation with with culture where gradually um, neoliberalism, i.e. the domination of you know massive corporate interests, that's what this, that's what neoliberalism is a code for really. That the, what corporate interests wanted to do was massively lower our expectations about what you could expect from culture. What they wanted to do is re reduce culture to entertainment again. What they wanted to do was have industry moguls, to, you know, uh, as an unbelievable situation has occurred now, hasn't it, I think, with people like Simon Cow, you know, um, acquiring a strange luster. You know, someone who's, who, who openly and brazenly has no cultural uh, acumen whatsoever, who's, you know, all that recommends him is a, is a capacity to, uh, you know, uh, keep, bit, keep betting on people's uh, capacity to buy rubbish. You know, th this is, you know, th and... You know, something that you couldn't imagine a figure like that. You know, uh, the, the level of conservatism required in order that a figure like this could become a sort of, uh, you know, uh, central to popular culture again. I think this is a measure of how bad things have got, actually. Um, that was the introduction to the introduction. You see why I'm not going to what I was, <laughs> what I was supposed to be doing. But, okay, what, what, I, I, you know, uh, one of the things I was really interested in then was... Uh, Simon's distinction between the two types of DIY, like you know the the kind of cool uh, dimension of DIY to do with <coughs> music and culture, etc., and the more depressing, mundane type of DIY, um, you know, to do with uh, maintaining your own um, um, domestic space. And I, I think really, in lots of ways, that 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 that, that opposition is um, or that shift is really one which is emblematic of a general cultural shift. Um, I think you know Simon was absolutely right in what he was saying about that. This, what was radical, interesting, etc., about DIY uh, 
in the period of punk, but as Simon also illustrated, DIY was nothing new up to punk. You know, it had been really the motor or engine of popular culture up to that point. What was interesting about it um, was not just that people were doing stuff. You know, uh, you know, people can do stuff. Uh, you know, been doing stuff throughout history or whatever. What, what mattered was that the, that, that the competition for public space. Um, and, and as Simon just at the end of his talk, the concept of public is crucial here. And I would also argue that alongside the concept of public space, and following on from Simon's remarks about the real scarcity now is the scarcity of attention, uh, what is also crucial is public time, public time, uh, uh, where, we, uh, uh, where we share things together. Um, and you know, that is inc an increasingly difficult um, to acquire that kind of public time. And actually, to refer to an example, that, refer to another dimension of the example I just mentioned, why, is, why are things like the X Factor, Britain's Got Talent popular? We, because they offer a sort of degraded version of public time. And you know, this is something to be celebrated, actually. That, you know, what people, even, even after the um, ideological blitz of neoliberalism with its emphasis on individualism, people still want public time and that they'll be prepared to put themselves through excruciatingly bad karaoke competitions in order to enjoy that public time, actually. Um, so that shift from, um, I mean, I, I was remembered when Simon started talking about um, DIY as in, um, you know, home improvements or whatever. I was reminded of that. Someone can probably help me here. I think it was a track by, um, it was by either Black Flag or Henry Rollins called Family Man. Where you know it's a kind of spoken word thing where Rollins just lays into the family man who's got his all his nails sorted out in his garage and all of that. I think that that you know that antipathy towards interiority, domesticity, etc., um, was really crucial actually to um, to, to, the, to the free song of, of, of post punk. But not more than that to the, everything that led up to post punk. Post punk was the swan song of what I call popular modernism. In, in lots, um, you know, that it's something which had developed in a post-war period, um, and you know, well, it wasn't quite the swan song because I think a lot of the things that Simon and I rem remain enthusiastic about in the 90s, like um, you know, UK dance music, it's, you know, in some sense inherited the mantle of popular modernism. Um, but you know, part of what I'd be saying was that really, since the start of the 21st century, roughly speaking, I, I think more like a decade ago from now, that. Popular modernism, popular modernism has been all but extirpated from culture, from mainstream culture. And you know, I think one thing to, to also remark upon at this point, also in reference to what Simon has said, is that uh, you know, it, it's not as if the mainstream has died. Uh, and, you know, in fact, a, 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 to refer to the X Factor example again, we see the mainstream is kind of bigger than it ever was in lots of ways. Um, because, I mean, part of the reason for that is. Um, we, we don't compete for it anymore. Uh, we've given up on it. You know, we've, uh, in, in a way, you know, one way of seeing this DIY cultural dimension of it is that it successfully hived us off into spaces where we could gain not, um, not the uh, melancholy perspective of the no audience underground that Simon talked about, but a sufficient audience underground. Um, and that allowed, really, um, you know, it, it, when we when we removed ourselves from the ma from the so-called mainstream, and by the mainstream I'd mean um, the heart of uh, sort of popular culture, and also of parliamentary politics. Um, when we when we removed ourselves from that, it's, it's not as if the right wing um, thought, um, okay, okay, well, they've left that alone now. We'll 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 also leave that alone. The right wing were rubbing their hands with glee when we did that. Trust me. Um, and Simon referred to um, Jody Dean's work, and I think um, probably it's Jody more than anybody else who woke me up from this kind of slumber about this kind of thing. That you know, as, as Jody points out, um, one of, I think one of the most forceful points is um, what we call post politics. You know, is just the end of our politics, the end of the left wing. Uh, the, on the right wing, you know, the right wing, particularly in the U.S., we can see the right wing is vociferously active in this period. That the right wing. Um, and also, another thing is uh, that Jody also points out is that we buy, on its own terms, the promises of um, a kind of participatory culture. We think things should be open. We shouldn't impose stuff on people. The right doesn't think that at all. The right thinks, okay, we've got all these channels available. We will impose our agenda on people. Uh, and that's what they've done. They've taken over 
parliamentary politics and installed what I call capitalist realism, i.e., that you know simply the belief that there's no alternative to capitalism, and you know, and specifically there's no alternative to neoliberal capitalism. Um, and they've uh, and they've completely taken over mainstream media with with small, with very small, increasingly tiny islands, um, where where that isn't the case anymore. You know, when I you know, I think it's interesting the 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 the, the, the concept of marginality actually, um, because you know when you when you know I've spoken to a number of sort of post-punk musicians or whatever, and um, it's, it's, they didn't want to be in a, they didn't want to be top of the independent charts. You know, they didn't want to be in this position of marginality. I mean, you know, I was talking to Mark Stewart of the pop group, and he said, look, we wanted to be the Beatles. You know, Joy Division wanted to be the Beatles. They didn't want to be in a special space. They wanted to compete, and that's part of what made them great. They, they had those ambitions. I think sort of behind Simon's talk, and something he's talked about elsewhere, and that's something I agree with, is this, what's behind DIY is a lowering of, a lowering of ambition as well as of expectation. You know, we'll just release stuff uh, and hand it around without, to our own set of sort of uh, like minds because we don't think that we can take on the mainstream culture. And what, what is that? Uh, and so that means that as we, we retreated from the battlefield. And you know, I really want to ret- retain this term of, 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 of war. That we basically, uh, you know, it's the old leftist slogan that it's only called class war when we fight back. And that you know the class war has been fought um, and very successfully on every front by the ruling class over the, over the last um, 30 years. They've paid themselves more. They, they expropriate more money out of us, you know. And 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 we call it post politics. That's great. Okay. Um, but so you know uh, this uh, so, um, part of how they were able to do that then is by. This process of what I call psychic privatization. Psychic privatization, which went alongside the privatization of public goods, etc. So, you know, everyone is, instead of being um, competing for public space or public time, everyone has retreated into a private space, you know, where, in lots of ways, you know, this is major in British TV. I don't know what it's like here. Uh, so many programs about doing up your own house. Um, and, you know, one of the most pernicious. Pernicious of these programs is this thing, Location, 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 uh, which is on ch- Channel 4, and actually that's, that's in itself significant. Channel 4, in the, in the early days of the, 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 the network, that's where I first saw Tarkovsky films. That's where they would have hour-long debates with philosophers on there. Now uh, it's Tories, you know, talking about, uh, well, you've got your £450,000. Um, are you going to spend it, you know, to buy a townhouse in London or a mansion up in, uh, you know, up in Yorkshire? As if, as, you know, as if this is normal, as if most people can, can, can afford this. Um, I'll come back to property maybe in a minute because I think, you know, that if you, well, I'll do it now. That the, <laughs> the, <laughs> if you want to look for one explanation for cultural conservatism, the decline of innovation, for the, uh, you know, it's simply the property prices, the major form of, uh, of social control in the UK. And as ever, when I come to sort of uh, Europe, I'm basically as a negative John the Baptist figure. You know, to say, uh, I know that, um, you know, that that, um, there's a creeping trend in in, in many European countries towards neoliberalization. And, um, you know, don't let it carry on is is, is the message. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, you know, part of what I'm I'm saying is using the UK as an example, UK, which was, you know, a wellspring of culture and working class creativity without any shadow of a doubt, you know, in the period of popular modernism. now uh, a dead husk, uh, you know, a dead husk full of uh, busy and harassed people trying to pay exorbitant rents and mortgages. You know, just I mean, uh, uh, you know, the fa- the, the, just last week uh, in the UK, in a, in a piece of legislation that went through almost unnoticed, um, you know, um, squatting was uh, there's more punitive legislation about squatting. Um, you know. One of the major enablers of the, the punk and post-punk scenes in the UK, in the US, and elsewhere was, 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 was squatting, simply that people could live in an urban environment. You know, the urban environment, as a concentrational force, I think, as a con- uh, which would bring things together um, in a way that I think the internet is a dispersal force, largely, actually. Not entirely, but I mean, I think Simon's right about, in a way, you need this synergy between the concentrational elements of the internet. That's why it was interesting. Things like um, 
you know, the Arab Spring or whatever. It was not because it broke from the normal conditions of cyberspace, which are dispersal, which are temporal and spatial dispersal, uh, 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 to, to bring about a kind of temporal and spatial um, convergence and concentration, actually. Um, but yeah, so the, I mean, as property prices, I think, that, that, that's, that's a, genius, um, a genius form of social control, really, because it simply means that people have so little free time um, so little time. Most of, most of the time of people in London is as that city of capitalist dystopia. You know, um, and no one was fooled by the 2012 uh, capitalist carnival. I hope because you know that was uh, uh, London is a miserable city. You know, an extremely miserable city, uh, and uh, um, really running off. I mean, it's really interesting. The um, the, the the opening ceremony. I mean, I, I mean, I did think it was interesting. I don't know how many people watched that. You know, as an example of kind of um, Anglo delirium or whatever, it was quite interesting. But that if you look at the, if you look at the musical examples there, um, if you, you know, it's heavily weighted on music, but almost none of the musical examples were, were recent. I mean, I think Dizzy Rascal was the latest. Was the latest, you know. Uh, and um, and if you, if you had the misfortune to see the um, the closing ceremony, uh, the, the excremental kitsch of the closing ceremony, that's what Britain's really like: mediocre, shoddy, and kind of really poor, you know. Um, but uh, um, so I guess the, 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 my message from this is that you, you know you, you can't just do, do it yourself. Actually, that the, the, the conditions. Of, I mean, I, I sort of slightly contrary to what Simon said. I do think there is there is something inherently kind of um, progressive about the notion of DIY, but only as something which is an aspiration. The aspiration is that everyone should be able to produce for themselves. Um, we're clearly not in the conditions where people can do that. And, you know, the, the false kind of um, recuperation of DIY I, 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 ideas by, um, uh, by corporate capital um, it is, it is evidence of how strong those ideas are. That, 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 you know, people, concepts like self-reliance, etc., are not intrinsically bad, of course. Um, but they are bad in conditions such as we <laughs> live in now, where people plainly do not have the conditions for self-reliance for themselves. And you know, one of the great sort of uh, genius moves of neoliberalism was really to capture the desire for freedom and democracy that people had developed, you know, in the in the 60s in particular, was to capture those desires and literally sell them back to them. In um, it's almost neoliberalism was almost like a genie in a fairy tale, where it did exactly what people said, but uh, given exactly what people said they wanted, but what they, when people found out that it's not quite what they wanted. I, 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 um, no, people wanted more freedom. Okay, wanted more flexibility. Okay, have precarity instead. You know, they wanted not to have a, a bureaucratic state uh, running everything. Okay, we'll pull all the benefits from you then. You know, and this is this is how neoliberalism has, has operated. But it doesn't mean I think the step that's sometimes taken by nostalgic Leninists is then to say, oh, well, what we really need then is to go back to uh, the old centralized state model. Um, you know, the, the, there's, a, the, there's a reason that collapsed, and it wasn't only the organized powers of capital that led to the disintegration of kind of state socialism. I mean, this is something that, you know, I, Michael Hart and um, Antonio Negri, I think, argue really well, but it's not just them, I mean, it's not just them who've come out with that, that it's the whole um, Italian autonomous tradition that they're coming from, which, which argues this point, I think, is absolutely right, that people didn't want to live under those conditions. People didn't want to live under uh, the conditions of state, um, state bureaucracy, massive state bureaucracies. Um, and, you know, the, the, and w the problem is that the, the right managed to, um, and I mean literally capture those desires, uh, whereas the left was left wrong-footed by it. The left is left in a state of kind of... Um, mandatory doubt, as it were. This is the kind of uh, the, the mode that the, the left went into, where it thought, well, okay, well, Stalinism is really oppressive and it's kind of forcing its ideas on people. Well, what we, you know, what, so what we need instead of that then is to be in a state of kind of chin-rubbing doubt and it's really good to not know what we, you know, what we really think about things. Well, I think you know, simply that opened up the space for the right who have, have no doubt I have no doubts at all that what they and have no compunction about telling us about how good they are for us. How 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 else have they robbed? Uh, the, how else did this this is the, the biggest swindle in the history of the planet? The um you know the, this 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 kind of great robbery um, of, of of bank bailouts. It's a, an astonishing swindle, but it's based on the premise of a very successfully ide disseminated ideological message that you know rich people are good for us. 
You know, we should be grateful that people are rich. You know, because we, we all benefit from that. Whereas uh, we're in our corner going, oh, I don't know if we're doing that good, and maybe we should maybe we should think more carefully about what we're saying. And all. you know, like uh, the, 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 we, well, this is these are not good conditions for winning a war. You know, I mean, I think partly what I'm saying here is that there's there's uh, there's the politics and aesthetics cross over, but conditions for aesthetics are maybe well f- conditions for good aesthetics may well be negative capabilities, as Keats called them, of doubts, misgivings, questioning. Conditions for winning a political war are conviction and strategy. The right know that, and that's why they're ruthless. You know, uh, and you know, uh, we, we need a certain amount of, of, of uh, you know, you know. I'm not, I'm not talking about you know, um, putting people in gulags, uh, you know, um, abusing people, anything like that. What I'm talking about is, is, is resilience, conviction, and resolution. You know, uh, on, on simple points that you know. We believe in you know, fairness and justice, and these are better than this conditions of total barbarism in which we now live, you know, in which, in, in which the, 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 the rich can cream off far more money than they could ever spend in a hundred lifetimes, while people are still starving at a, you know, on some areas of the planet. And it's an obvious point to make. But nonetheless, the obviousness of it should translate into the obviousness of convictions as well. And I think that that's the, 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 the problem is that it doesn't say much. Oh God! All right. Okay. Sorry. I'm just. <laughs> I'm going off the point. That was off the point. But never mind. It's okay. Um, so, I mean, okay. So, I mean, all of this is extremely live. I think in in a, in a context of the UK, which I, you know, I, I mentioned, of course, because I know about it, but also because I think it, the UK has been a laboratory of neoliberalism in Europe. And, and you know, New Labour is the model for the kind of so, the capitulation of socialist parties. To, 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 to capitalism, really. Um, you know, in the UK, the whole concept of the big society, which uh, um, you may have heard about, the big society being... A, 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 this shows up... I mean, OK, there's a reason for hope, folks, is how bad the right wing are now. OK, what made the right wing strong in the 80s was they were used to fighting um, trade unions and used to fighting their left. And that's why, you know, they, they were, were battle-hardened. This bunch of flabby Etonians that we've got running um, in Britain at the moment, hopeless. They've got no clue at all. They don't. They, they're not. They're not. They're not used to fighting anything. And I got to the stage this week where I started feeling sorry for Cameron. Like Cameron's now like the kind of uh, the, the janitor for the, the ruling class. He's, he's, he's having to like clean. He's having to. What, last year he had to apologise for that whole for, for, for Murdoch and you know um, and 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 the, and the Metropolitan Police. Um, um, and you know, and the whole political class in the UK, you know, basically saying, yeah, we're, we're all corrupt. Um, this and this week is now having to apologise once again for the police because of the the, the, the Hillsborough thing. You know, the, um, it, it's the, the, despite the. I mean, I think there's two stories going on here. In other words, one is okay. We we have been weakened on our side, and you know, the successful campaign of against uh, really, I think, two key leftist uh, principles, values of solidarity and security. I think those are, those are effectively uh, eroded and destroyed um, by um, the neoliberal project. But the neoliberal project is itself in a serious trouble, and the ruling class in serious problems of legitimacy. And that's the other side of what, of what has happened in the DIY culture, is that the kind of cover-up that was engaged in about the Hillsborough disaster in the 80s would not be possible, actually, because of things like um, Twitter, the Internet, etc. That, that the level of informational leakage um, is much greater, and, and really, that you know, power, the logistics of power depend upon us, you know um, being able to do things behind closed doors. That, that, that they're increasingly unable to do things behind closed doors, and that's one of the kind of dialectical dimensions of this uh, uh, of this kind of uh, destruction of, of 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 the kind of um, aura of, of of a kind of a mainstream um, political and uh, entertainment culture. I think. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, that, that being just a way of explaining how such a sh- shitty concept as big society could be floated by Tories uh, in the UK, the, by the ruling class, in other words. In a big society, then, a play, uh, uh, it's difficult to, uh, um, to remember that this is how, this is how sort of pad- poorly thought through that the, the, the concept of big society is a play on the idea of big state. Okay, not a big state, which is really, which is bad, we all know that. Big states are terrible. But a big society, where and what's a big society is where everybody participates and does things. Um, there's a great, um, there's a couple of comedians who did a great satire on this, where they, uh, 
they uh, they they sort of went into the role of um, being members of the ruling coalition in, in the UK at the moment, and they go around and knock on people's doors and say, "What, what are you doing tonight?" And uh, I said, "Well, you know, well, I've just come back from work, and you know, just got to, uh, sort of got to feed the kids and put them to bed and all that." Okay, you know, well, what are you doing after that? Uh, how about some time working with your community, right? You know. Um, how, how about um, emptying some bins and stuff? I mean, of course, you know, th- this is this, is a, this is absurd model where you're asking people who are already overworked to to do more. Uh, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, quite clearly that the concept of the big society then was a, 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 another example, and trying to push on the already extreme kind of ne- neoliberal privatisation a step further, where people would, you know, work with communities um, and uh, sort of voluntary groups, i.e., all of these things which. You know, we th- we thought we'd sort of done better than uh, in the 20th century. Like voluntary groups, okay, fine, but they they really stood in for a kind of impersonal system of care that was provided by um, you know social democracy, really. That and that, that and, and there's something good about that personality, actually. Um, that uh, you know, care without community is you know, and with, with, with you know, nationalised health systems, that that's that's a, that's a good achievement. And, and going and, and claiming that we, you know there's an advance to return to conditions of 19th century philanthropy, you know this is this is you know, simply not not true. Now, it's, which isn't to say, and you know, that, that the, the, the step we, we it's a mistake to make then is to then think, oh well, social democracy was this gleaming zenith, which nothing you know, um, and um, you know, or that's the best we can hope for. You know, things might not have been that great under social democracy, but uh, you know, they're much better than they are now. And that, well, that's true in lots of some ways, um, but that doesn't mean that we should be satisfied with that. I mean, one of the th- things to learn um, if you st- study the rise of neoliberalism was how it made the political impossible, uh, pl- politically impossible, become the only possible model of realism. You know that. Um, and the current issue of the London Review of Books is a great story about um, the privatisation of electricity in, in the UK, saying <laughs> um, uh, Britain's the only country stupid enough to privatise its electricity. And um, uh, but, um, that, uh, the part of the argument there is that, 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 that the architect of the, of the concept of privatisation, um, his, you know, his, when he was coming up with this idea that all nationalised industry should be should be privatised, it was regarded utterly crazed, utterly crazed. This could never happen. Yet, within a decade, it had happened. You know, uh, in, in, in a country that at that time, you know, remember the UK was like at that time, that seemed to be dominated by, you know, um, that, well, not dominated by that that would be falling into the kind of neoliberal um, retrospective picture, but where. You know, the workers' movement was a major component of social power at that time. Um, so, you know, how did they, they, you know, they planned for something that seemed impossible and far beyond the reaches of the current possibility. Then this is the big lesson about political possibility is, um, uh, you know, relative to the, the current situation. And, uh, you know, if you can see beyond the current situation and, and think beyond it, um, you can, you can, the impossible becomes the inevitable. And you know, and 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 a part of what I'm sort of suggesting then is, is, and this relates to the, the if you read the piece that I wrote for um, Gonzo Circus on on time wars and struggle over time and attention. I mean, the, part of the problem with the, the sort of culture, the digital culture that Simon was describing earlier, was that um, it puts us in a permanent state of reactive ta- react- reactivity. That I mean, that's the other side of what we call activity is as actually. Uh, reactivity. And actually, the concept which c- captures this is from uh, uh, Robert Fowler. Uh, interpassivity. Interpassivity is, is, the, is, the, is, is really the dominant mode of, uh, of, 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 of kind of social media. It's not that it can't be used for other things, but that is, I think, the typical form of um, how, how social media operates. And that's why, the, that's why, that's why corporations <laughs> love it. You know, join in the debate. You know, upload your content here to us. You know, um, that they, they 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 like it because it's for for many reasons. One of which you know, one of which is, you know, that you're generating value for them. <laughs> simply, I mean, why weren't we all up in arms when this, with this Facebook thing? Why weren't we demanding our money back? But why, you know, why we have created, you know, that they put the infrastructure in, but we've created the content which makes it valuable. How can then? Uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg sort of w- walk off with sort of billions of dollars. 
as a result of our work, and why aren't we angry about it? It's your labor that made him that money. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but, I mean, so that... Uh, so, I mean... I mean, what you find with something like what we find with, with Twitter, and another case of massive dialectical ambivalence for me, I'm always just about to leave Twitter. <laughs> but, but, but then you get things like the Olympic closing ceremony, which is only tolerable if, you've, if you can share it with other people on, on, on Twitter, you know. Uh, but, and, and, and I think that is the value of, of Twitter, right there. One, of the, one of the values of Twitter but, uh, is as counter media. Um, you know, part of what I started saying earlier on about the, and I think this is an important point, the mainstream hasn't gone away. The, the point is, that the, 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 in a way, as Simon was saying, that the, it's the opposition to and within the mainstream that has disappeared and has been disabled in lots of ways by digi- digital DIY culture. Um, but the mainstream, the mainstream may be quantitatively weakened in certain ways, but it's still culturally hegemonic. And that's why, if you look at what's on Twitter, it isn't things that have been generated... Um, uh, horizontally, by Twitter itself, uh, most, of, most of the content on Twitter is generated in relation to the, the mainstream media. Uh, but I think that's put, that on the other side of it is part of the value of it, as I indicated before, as a counter media, as an immediate kind of, you know, it's the only way of coping with being inside this utterly inane kind of uh, neoliberal culture in many ways. Um, and, and it does produce, I mean, so uh, along, you know, because of Twitter and the Olympics closing ceremony, you know, you, you did have a sense of something that was worth sharing, i.e. contempt for what was going on in front of you, rather than something which you had been invited to share, which was, you know, the, the wonderful uh, full illustration of the co- contradictions of capitalism, uh, with Jesse J saying it's not about the price tag while standing on a gold Rolls Royce. So the, um, I won't talk the whole time so we can have some, some participation. But, um, okay, so, I mean, I think what's striking in a UK example this year um, is, you know, the, the, the full extent of the conservatism in the UK now. The mass- 2012 has been a massive carnival of reaction. You know, um, the, 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 the Royal Jubilee and then, and then the Olympics. You know, the, the Olympics are ambivalent, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, you know, and with no, with no disruption or very minimal disruption in the, in the mainstream culture. And that's partly because of vicious, preemptive policing. Um, you know, there's a the story in The Guardian of the Week about someone who was dressed as a zombie sitting in Starbucks on the day of the, um, the, the jub- some of the Jubilee celebrations, who, who was preemptively arrested because they may well have been, they might be planning to take part in an anti-Jubilee demonstration. Where are all these anarchist groups in the UK? Who, it's funny with the anarchist groups in the UK that they can, um, when there's a TUC demonstration, they're very active, they're, they're smashing windows. Uh, where were they? When it, where, where, where were they when it came to the, the, this uh, de- utterly depressing, reactionary, barbarous spectacle of celebration of, of monarchy and, and empire? Where, where were they then to disrupt that? Or maybe they didn't want to be arrested. Well, okay, well, why did, why did, why did, why did, why did they risk? Um, being arrested when, uh, at, at, at um, gen- demonstrations by trade unions, etc. It's, it's almost as if they're adjunct provocateurs put there by the state, isn't it? Um, anyway, but the, <laughs> but that, um, and I don't fully think that. But, it, but but the point is, the point is not the point is that they might as well be. And I, I, just, I just don't understand this actually. If they think there's some inherent kind of value in smashing up windows and stuff, why don't they do it all the time? I mean, you know, the, uh, why do they only do it when there's big uh, demonstrations by sort of, um, the trade unions, etc.? I don't, don't really understand that as a strategy, but they don't have strategy because it's oh, forget it. Okay, but the, I mean, uh, seriously though, I think the part of the problem we've got in, um, with the left is that the domination of kind of anarchism and neo-anarchism in, in the thinking. We see this the Occupy movement, um, where um, you know, um, I, I think this is a, a pernicious horizontalism in a way, where you know, we're, 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 there's this kind of a, a implicit and not so implicit ideology behind it of, um, you know, it's just that you know, no one should be above anybody else, you know. Um, but, and, uh, and also that mainstream media is decadent, which is not worth bothering with. We don't struggle with mainstream, we don't bother struggling with, and, and also that um, uh, parliamentary politics, local government, all of those things, they're decadent, superseded, etc. Um, and kind of, it's also a libidinal argument somehow, that those things are boring, whereas, you know, um, uh, s- somehow this d- so-called direct action is, 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 is kind of uh, much more interesting but 
you know, if surely, like, I don't know, I can't think of anything much more boring than an eight-hour, an eight-hour kind of general assembly, really. Like, surely, like, you know, if you actually read the accounts of, like, you know, the struggles of, like, you know, um, uh, Ken Livingston to take over the Great London Council and all of that, that's exciting. You know, sitting around, you know, doing jazz hands for eight hours, that seems to me the worst of all worlds in lots of ways. It's not really getting any political... Uh, you know, I think, well, let's contrast that with... Um, you know what the right does. The right, a lot of the right, the right does is, you know, um, quite boring, you know, organisational work. You know, and, and, and boring work, and it's, bo- and it's work to manipulate people. You know, it's not that exciting to do it, but it's, it's really effective. You know, and the dominant force on the planet is PR, uh, public relations, and um, you know, this is what fundamentally shapes. The, you know, people's experience of the life, uh, of life, and, and, and especially working class. I mean, the working class are probably most ambivalent about it because they're both inside that PR world more fully than, a, than the middle class who have a degree of skepticism and, and cynicism about it, which doesn't make them immune to it, of course. Um, but also fully outside it as well. Um, but you know, and, and, and I think taking seriously that the, the, the role of PR and, the, and of how do we constitute and how do we constitute a counterforce to PR? And that, that, means, I mean, that means taking indirect action seriously. What the, what the right is good at is indirect action. What is hegemony? You know, what is it to control an ideology, a reality system? It's indirect action. It's control of, of, of media. Um, it's con- you know, control of um, people's you know, perceptions, affects, etc. This is what the right has beat us hands down. In take not only in doing it, but in taking that seriously as something, uh, as a terrain which we, which we should be fighting over, really. Um, and, yes, yeah, so there's a carnival of reaction, and I think, you know, for me, uh, there was a, the, the 2012 echoed 1977, you know, in that um, 77 was the year, you know, both of punk and of the Jubilee, and it was a clearly a... Um, it's clearly some antagonist, antagonistically, antagonistically productive relationship between those two things. And you know, that was what was kind of most, um, one of the most depressing aspects of 2012 was where was the, where was the, where was the antagonism? Um, where was the visible antagonism? You know, uh, lots of, there's lots of sort of diffuse grumbling about it, but, but the, the point is that the, the level of indirect action, which is partly a symbolic or cultural space, where, where, where was this registered? How was, how was the, you know, the massively right-wing kind of <laughs> anti-democratic um, barbarian monarchism, how was that forced to register any kind of um, c- counter um, discourse? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, the, the pathetic spectacle of the, of, of the BBC as this supine kind of monarchist um, lick spittles. You know, uh, they're going on for days as well, not even doing it very well. They didn't, they're going to be bothered to find out stuff. Anyway, but the... But the um, you know, and that's the kind of the, the, the shadow, really, of, uh, of, 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 20, of, of 2012. I mean, and also, I mean, since we had a music festival, uh, what, I mean, what is striking to me is the, f- the complete failure of music to engage with, um, with, with, uh, with, with culture. You know, um, and, and, and where, since there is lots of diffuse antagonism, uh, you know, in, in the culture, you know, um, if you're my age, you're, um, you, you, you're used to that antagonism being filtered through music. It's, it's shocking how, how, how little music has responded or, or intensified this current situation. It's not there's nothing, there's always something. You know, well, you know, everything happens at some level. But it's, it's about, you know, th- you know, as Simon was talking about those thresholds of, of, of kind of, I can't remember the, the exact phrase, but thresholds of relevance in a way. And it's about, it is about, you know, thresholds of relevance. That, it, that, that, that needed to, uh, the, the, the impact on a hegemonic perception of the world, and there was not, there has been none of that from music for some time. And you know, the, the, what's what's was striking about the most exciting developments in youth culture, the most exciting things that the youth culture in the UK in the last few years have nothing to do with music at all. And they were the uh, the, the student militancy at the end of 2010, and the the the, the English riots last year. 
Now, I'm not going to be in a position of, un, you know, uh, um, I don't want to be put in this position of sounding as if I'm uncritically celebrating the riots. The riots were sublime in a, in a tr- proper Kantian sense, and that are, uh, uh, you know, are objects of both, of both terror and wonder. You know, that people had, uh, people had broken out of, um, you know, the, the people had to some extent broken out of this prison of interpassivity where nothing would ever happen anymore. You know, in a spectacular way, where the, 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 you know, the suddenly the whole sense of what reality was could be warped. It felt like you're not watching a film, but you're inside a film suddenly when, when, those, when those riots were going on. And, you know, and, and the, the, uh, once again, I must emphasize, I'm not simply celebrating a situation where you know, families are being burnt out of their houses and stuff like that. That's not the, the point of this. Um, but the point was, you know, the, the, faced with the sublime um, apparition, of, of those riots, where is music in, in relation to this? There's nowhere. You know, music has really faded out, and, and, and maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's why. Maybe it's, music is not. I mean, the, you know, the, the old sort of the Adornian type argument against kind of engaged political music was that you know, again, or, or Marcuse or whatever these people would be that it was a form of controlled desublimation, that and that you know, antagonism that would elsewhere be, um, uh, you know, a directly. Uh, forced against that sort of ruling class was was, was instead um, expressed through culture. Maybe there's an argument for this actually. I mean, but but, but part of the the issue with the, the English riots and why, just not on a, on a moral level, but on a political level, why one shouldn't celebrate them is uh, it's a kind of interesting case of. Uh, I mean, the, the points um, up to the point where um, up to the point where those riots had happened last year. The, the ruling class in, in Britain was in real trouble. It was in serious, serious problems because of uh, what was happening with uh, the whole uh, News International um, scandal. And uh, I think we're... And, and, and really, the, the, the riots initially intensified that, but by the end of the week, there was a massive authoritarian backlash. We had you know, Oxford historians on televisions being able to say that the, problem, the problems of British society are black culture. And, and he meant... Specifically, black music as well. Uh, even and, and you know that the, the showed you how much the conditions had changed. That he was on the BBC and able to say that by the end of the week. Um, but you know, so it not, it not only did it prompt an authoritarian backlash, I think that it was also not um, you know it wasn't it clearly whilst it was negatively political, it was, in, it, was, it was social, political, and aesthetic conditions which led to those which led to those riots. I think what we're talking about is something I call aesthetic poverty, as well as actual poverty. Now, there's, um, now a lot of the things that a lot of the right wingers would say, oh, these riots weren't caused by um, these riots weren't caused by uh, p- poverty. They've got mobile phones. They've got Blackberries. But look, a Blackberry simply isn't a Blackberry or mobile phone. Is uh, for communitive capitalism is like a lathe was for an industrial worker. It's not, a, it's not an entertainment object. It's a means by which you're plugged into the. The, the late capitalist matrix. It's how it sells you stuff. It's how it keeps you hooked in. But th- for that very reason, it's also like it's got these dialectical possibilities. And that was the that was really interesting that, that kind of organizational infrastructural dimensions of the riot was the fact that instead of being used to maintain people in states of kind of narcissistic interpassivity, instead of that, then you know the the, the BlackBerry was used as a form of organization. And um, one couldn't help but be struck. Well, I couldn't help but be struck by it. That's not every, but by the the, uh, the the way that this was an almost direct reversal of what had happened in. If people remember that film from the 1979, The Warriors. Um, this is a this is a very interesting film, I think, uh, uh, partly because of the period of, of which it happened. I, at the very um, threshold of the the coming of neoliberalism. Uh, at the start of The Warriors, if you, if you remember it, is uh, there's all of the gangs of New York are cult called together. Uh, and, 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 and it's put to them a proposition that if we all join up, uh, then we'll take over the city. But of course, randomly and arbitrarily, it seems, um, a shot is fired at, um, at, the, at the, 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 the sort of person making this speech. It then scatters back into the standard kind of Hobbesian um, territoriality and war of all against all. Um, it's almost as if the, the, the UK riots, or the, sorry, I should say the English riots, because they only happened in England. Um, Scottish and Welsh people get annoyed. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the English rights are almost the opposite of that, where you know, the, there's the beginnings of development of a class consciousness through Black Bee Messenger. Instead of fighting each other, we'll fight a common enemy. Um, 
And you know, and, and, and I think that in a way that this is how I can probably draw things to, to a conclusion is that um, at, is by thinking about the possibilities of Leighton in this form of organisation, not yet realised in, in the riots, but clearly there to be mobilised. That um, just after those riots had happened, um, there was an event at the um, at Tate Modern where the Black Audio Film Collective appeared, and they'd made an astonishing film. Um, if you've not seen it. Um, try and seek it out. It's sort of actually very difficult to get hold of their stuff, which is another story um, about the decline of popular modernism. Because they, if anyone exemplified it, it was them. You know. Um, but the Black Audio Film Collective made a film in 1986 called Handsworth Songs, which was about um, the Handsworth riots. And, and part of what made that film powerful was its uh, experimental form. It wasn't a finger wagging kind of. Um, a pedagogic type film is a film that used experimental sound, montage, etc., to make its point. Um, but you know, just so just there was a, an event uh, at the Tate Modern where this, this was shown, and the uh, members of the collective uh, there to discuss it. And John O'Confer, the uh, director of the film, uh, said, "Well, look, you know, of the current riots, or the, the, then the current riots. Look, you've got a situation where you've got the, these kids who can." Organise and within three days bring the British state to its knees. You know, imagine what it, that would be like if you know if they if they got properly organised. You know, there's there's a real power there. Um, but uh, you know, I think we we really have to. I think it's sort of implicit in Simon's talk and something that I really want to uh, take hold of and sort of end on today um, is the idea. Okay, what is the, what is the problem actually with this massive proliferation of of culture, this kind of unfiltered culture? Um, and, and a question from the back about curatorship, I think, was important in this respect. Um, what is the problem with this massive proliferation of, 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 of culture? Is is really it's to do with the question of authority, actually? And that um, what 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 does what does curatorship add? It adds authority. Um, authority is not a word that the, the left likes to use at all, be, because I think we've been successfully suckered here um, into again into a position of self-defeat. Um, where you know we equate authority with authoritarianism, uh, and you know authority really is authority. Authoritarianism is the abuse of authority, and it's effectively opposed not by being anti-authority, but by a properly constituted model of what authority is. And you know that I think some one of the pernicious dimensions of kind of neo neo anarchist horizontalism is it pretends we can just dispense with the question of authority. Altogether, we can, just, we can just get rid of it. Um, when in fact, um, we haven't. Whilst on our side, i.e., on the left side, there's lots of hand wringing about authority. On the right, once again, uh, there's there's full occupation of, of authority. That means that we don't have a de- democratic or collective model of what authority could be, and that makes things really difficult. If you're a teacher like I am, if you're working with young people, um, you know, um, what a, if if I'm not to believe in authority at all, then surely I should just say. You know, hey man, your, value, your views are valid as mine. I just sit down. You know, and, uh, and that that is not only uh, that's that's not that's not only is that uh, that's obviously clearly failing, failing the young. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's also you know, it's, it's just it's, it's, it, it, it's plainly false and something that no one really really believes in. Now, you know, the fact that we believe in equality doesn't mean that we be- doesn't mean that we believe that you know people have equal skills, knowledges, etc. And part of you know part of overcoming inequality is how do we transmit the skills and knowledge that we've got. And so, and, and I think and this is the question about and this question was a very ex- excellent, excellent discussion in the Tate um, Tate Modern about the um, about uh, you know that uh, in response to that um, uh, Black Audio Film Collective film. And, you know, that, and, and the spectre of authority was raised there again, in, in a way that um, we need to re-engage. In other words, we need to re-engage from positions of authority w- w- with the young in lots of ways, um, and for positions of authority, not positions of authoritarianism. You know, and that that is, a, and, and we need to be able to transmit the skills and knowledge that we've got to them. But clearly, of course, this is as anyone who's uh, done teaching realizes this is not a, a one-way. Process. You always learn something from those you are teaching. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important that we on the left take responsibility for the positions of authority which we now occupy anyway. 
The point is that we are in these positions of authority. And being neurotic about it and, and disavowing it is failing everybody, including those who are supposed to be um, uh, you know, teaching and assisting. Um, so uh, I'll end on that, I think. I don't know, I don't know how I'm doing for time. But... <laughs> okay, yeah.